So look, in the last few years, there's been quite a lot of talk uh, about uh, water market prices in the Southern Basin. Uh, and what I'll do today is, is run through that piece of work that David mentioned before, where we attempted to unpick what's going on uh, in the market. So that full report's on our website. What I'll do today is try and rise above that detail as best I can and, and just give you some of the key uh, conclusions from that report. And the motivation for this report uh, was really from the last few years and probably a, a partly as my time at the uh, Murray-Darling Basin Authority where we were hearing all sorts of commentary out there about what's going on with uh, water markets and, and prices. And there are all sorts of theories about why the prices seem to be higher uh, than people expected for the given amount of water in the dams. So these theories range from environmental water filling up dams to speculators uh, to all sorts of other theories. So we thought, let's have a look so we can find any systematic uh, information about what's actually going on. And we couldn't find a lot. So we thought, let's try and lift the hood on that and, and have a, a detailed look. So the basic conclusion from this work, and it's a pretty unsurprising sort of conclusion, is that prices are mainly driven by the overall supply of water, which is driven by how much it's rained. Um, so, but prices have, however, been higher in the last few years, given the level of water in storages. And we think this has mainly been the result of, a, of some changes to what's called state water sharing plans and the increased use of carryover. And I'll go into the details in a moment. <laughs> But there's also been other factors that have impacted on supply and demand, and these have also influenced uh, prices. And at the end of the talk, I'll, I'll run through some of the things that I think might influence prices in, in the medium term. So before I get into that, I thought I'd better explain where the southern Murray-Darling Basin is. So the inset shows the Murray-Darling Basin, and the southern basin is basically the southern third of the Murray-Darling Basin. So there's a pretty extensive water market in, in the southern basin. Uh, water entitlement holders can buy and sell these entitlements permanently or they can buy and sell what's called the seasonal allocation associated with that entitlement. Uh, and it's quite a substantial market. In 2015-16 there's something like 20,000 individual trades and about 5,000 gigalitres worth of water. So it's so quite a big market and it's quite important therefore to have some good information out there about what's going on in these markets. So what's been happening to prices? Well, uh, as, as we'd expect, there's a fairly strong correlation between uh, average annual allocation prices and the amount of water in the dams, the storage volume. So we can see here in, in, in this figure, every dot uh, is rep every year, sorry, is represented by a dot, and that's between 2000, 2001, and 2015, 16. And we can see that in the last four years, that's the blue line, prices have been a little higher than the historic uh, relationship. Um, so we would agree with some of that commentary out there uh, that the prices have been a little higher. So why is this? Well, the main two reasons are the ones I mentioned before, some changes to state water sharing plans and increased use of carryover. So to state water sharing plans, and that's a picture of Hume Dam in case anyone was wondering, but these state water sharing plans effectively establish the rules for how water is shared between different users, and that includes how annual allocations are set. And there's been a number of changes to these plans since about the year 2000. And so this includes more conservative forecasts of future uh, inflows, uh, increased rules-based water for the environment. Now, this is separate from the basin plan, environmental water, uh, and new storage reserve policies. So what these changes have meant is that for a given level of water in storage, allocations have tended to be a little lower, uh, and that reduction in supply has put upward pressure on, on prices. Next to carryover. So carryover allows entitlement holders to use water in the following year if they don't use it in the current year. And again, there's been a number of changes to these rules, and in particular since the late 2000s. And we can see from about 2009-10 onwards, it's the blue, yeah, the blue component there, it's significantly increased. And in particular around 2010-11, and that's largely was driven by uh, some changes in Victoria where carryover was made much more accessible and, and hence a lot more carryover occurred. So we can see these aren't insignificant amounts of water and it effectively means that there's water in the dams that's been effectively set aside. Um, uh, so it, it adds to that perception that prices have been higher uh, given that there's more water in, in storages. But of course the actual impact uh, carryover has on prices is a little more, more nuanced and complicated than that. Uh, and it actually depends on how much water is carried over from last year compared to how much of this year's water is carried over into next year. 
And what we've actually found is that carryover can have a, a smoothing effect on prices through time. So in wetter years, we tend to see an increase in storage, in, sorry, an increase, in, sorry, I'll start again. In wetter years, we see increase in carryover reserves, which reduces supply in that water and makes prices higher than what they would otherwise have been in the absence of carryover. And in dry years, the reverse is the case. We see users draw down on their carryover reserves, making prices lower than they would otherwise have been. So to demonstrate this, uh, we've got a, a model, and we, we ran through this model, just a hypothetical uh, extra 500 gigalitres of carryover between 2005-06 and 2006-07. And in 2006-07, uh, was quite a, a dry year um, compared to 2005-06, so prices were higher in that year. But what our model tells us uh, in this in particular run is that prices would have been $16, megalitres, $16 a megalitre higher in 2005-06 but $61 a megalitre lower in the dry year of 2006-07. So while carryover can lead to higher prices in some years, it's generally viewed as a pretty positive thing because it helps buffer against those higher prices, particularly in the, in the dry years. So back to the, the original part of the story, once we control for carryover, increased use of carryover in these changes to water sharing plans, we can see that those blue dots move closer in line with the historic uh, relationship between allocation prices uh, and allocation volumes. Now, of course, the uh, relationship there is not perfect. There's still quite a bit of variation occurring there between the years, uh, and we think there's a bunch of reasons for that. But as I said at the beginning, the overwhelming factor driving prices is how much it's rained uh, in that particular year, and that, of course, impacts how much water's in the dam, but also on-farm demand uh, for water. So some of the other factors that I'll go through now uh, that we think have influenced prices as well uh, is the water recovery under the basin plan has had an impact, some water trading restrictions and some demand side changes. So I'll run through those now. So water recovery under the basin plan uh, has reduced the amount of consumptive water available. Uh, so while the basin plan became law in late 2012, water recovery actually started a few years before that. And what this graph shows is how the environmental allocations um, uh, have, have uh, appeared in the graph and how it's reduced the amount of consumptive water by about 14% in 2015-16. What I haven't included in this graph is water recovery through infrastructure investments. These infrastructure investments are investments made by farmers and irrigation companies in the Australian Government that effectively save water. They reduce losses, they reduce evaporation and the like. Now, the effect of those is basically to, at least partly, offset this 14% reduction, but I haven't included them uh, in the analysis here. What we have done is we've, we've quantified the impact of the buybacks on allocation prices. And so that's shown uh, in this slide here. So between 2013-12-13 and 2014-15, the impact of the purchases under the Commonwealth program for the basin plan, we estimate at around $25 per megalitre on average. Now this is similar to an estimate by the consulting company called Aether last year. They came up with a number of $22 a megalitre over the same period. Now what should be noted here is it's only a few years, we've only got a few sample points, so um, these numbers should be viewed as indicative, but I guess there's some reassurance that Aether's estimate and our estimate uh, are similar, and then maybe we're equally wrong, not sure, but uh, there's some comfort in that those numbers are similar. So the next factor I'd like to talk about is trade restrictions. So there are quite a few trade restrictions uh, around the basin, uh, and they can lead to significant regional differences in allocation prices. And what this slide shows is the allocation prices in the Murrumbidgee and the Murray region over the period from late 2014 through to middle of 2016. And we see through the first half of that time period there, the prices track each other quite nicely. Water is freely traded between the areas. But in the middle of that time, around the middle of 2015, there was a trade restriction imposed which effectively stopped trade out of the Murrumbidgee. So what we saw was this price differential appear as the supply in the Murray was uh, restricted. There is a brief period there in about February 2016 where the lines came back together as the, the trade restriction was lifted, uh, but it soon came back in and we see the, the two lines diverge again. Now next to demand side changes, 
And in particular, one that I wanted to uh, highlight was the increased plantings of almonds in, in the Southern Basin uh, in, in the last decade or so. And this has been particularly evident in the Victorian Murray region. And this has been driven by pretty high almond prices, and that's at least in part due to the, the Californian drought and the situation over there. But of course, associated with the increased plantings of almonds is an increase in the application rate of water. Almonds are pretty thirsty uh, plants. And in particular, there, I draw your attention to the blue line, which is the production line. Uh, and what tends to happen with almonds is the older they get, the more mature they are, the more water they tend to, tend to require when they come into full production. Another thing to note about increased demand in the southern basin is we've seen cotton uh, drift into the southern part of the basin with the new varieties that can take the, the slightly shorter growing season down there. We haven't quantified the impacts of changes in demand on, on prices, but our, our guess is that it's probably is putting upward pressure on uh, prices. Of, of course, there are some other sectors that are going the other way, but we think in net it's probably upward, but we haven't quantified that, that impact. So what about the future? Well, uh, we think there's a, a bunch of things to think about on the supply and the demand side for the medium term outlook for uh, allocation prices. And the first on the scarcity side is the changing climate. Now, there's various estimates out there about how a, a changing climate might influence uh, inflows. But I think under most projections, the inflows into the southern Murray-Darling Basin are predicted to fall. Another factor there to uh, consider is the bushfires that we've had in Victoria uh, and southeast New South Wales uh, through 2002, 3 through to 8, 9. Now, what's happened there is as those forests regrow uh, at a particular time, they increase their transpiration, which reduces the uh, inflows into, into the rivers. Now, there are various estimates out there. I haven't included any here, but it's, it's probably, again, reasonable to assume that that would reduce inflows as well. Of course, there's remaining water recovery under the basin plan. Now, at the moment, uh, around 2,000 gigalitres across the whole basin has been recovered as a part of the basin plan of the 2750 gigalitres set out in the basin plan. Now, I won't go into the complications of the what's called the sustainable diversion limit adjustment mechanism, but effectively, uh, that number could change. And all that hasn't uh, quite landed yet, but it's fair to say that there may well be uh, some extra amount of water recovered recovery required above the 2,000 gigalitres where we are at the moment. On the demand side, uh, as we'd expect, water is, uh, the demand for water is driven by short and long-term profitability of the different activities. And, and we think that the increased profitability of cotton and nuts, almonds in particular, uh, is likely to see a net increase in the demand for water in the Southern Basin. Now, Peter talked about um, some new infrastructure or new investments in water efficient uh, technologies. Now they could uh, offset some of that uh, pressure on higher prices. Uh, but I guess how much remains to be seen and it comes down to sort of the dollars and cents of it all, the price of water versus the cost of those uh, investments. Um, I might leave it there. Thanks.